welcome everyone into the Dublin Book Festival. This is our last event, so the whole team are outside going, yay! <laughs> it's been a wonderful festival, and we're delighted to have Poor Chandrika has been, I think she's been at every event, um, we've had her doing a lot of chairing and hosting, so we're delighted to be able to celebrate her launch from stem cells to stars, poetry and physics. Um, we have, this is our first time we've been associated with Science Week 2023 and we're delighted it's worked so well and it's amazing to see so many people engaging with this um, element of our programme. So I'm going to welcome, a warm welcome to Chandrika and her guests. Thank you. Phenomenal. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for this really great crowd. I felt like perhaps it was too niche, but apparently not, so that makes me very happy. Um, so I'm very excited to be here with you all today, joined by these wonderful poets, physicists, poet physicists, physicist poets, <laughs> uh, uh, Rosamund Taylor, Iggy McGovern, Rucha Banare, and Sersha Anton. Uh, so thank you so much. And then we have the wonderful Susan here with ISO Interpretation. Um, also, this is being recorded with captions, so if you like it, want to watch it again or share it, you will be able to watch it later. So I'm going to have a, a, a lengthy intro to talk about this whole project and how it came about. So my name is Chandrika Narayanan Mohan, and I'm a writer, performer, and cultural consultant living here in Dublin for the last 11 years. In 2019, my immigration status changed to allow me to freely pursue my interests, and since then I've been published by Daedalus Press, Lifeboat Press, Poetry Ireland, Banshee, and Stinging Fly, amongst others, which has been amazing. A big part of being allowed to live and work freely in Ireland was that I had a renewed interest in the space where art and science collide. And in 2021, I was accepted as part of the Science Gallery Dublin's Rapid Residency, where I met uh, Brendan Owens over there uh, as a mentor and created poems based on um, a physicist's work as a space weather researcher. With the closure of our beloved Science Gallery, um, Brendan moves to the Institute of Physics uh, as public engagement manager. And I thought creating a writing residency with the, um, with the IOP would be an amazing way to continue our partnership with the creation of new work, um, creating new poems inspired by other physicists, this time with a specific focus on minoritized voices in STEM. So I applied for an Arts Council Project Award and we got it. So we, this year we've had a number of events in Northern Irish Science Week, uh, the IOP annual meeting, and a workshop with students at the Trinity Access Program Summer School. And finally today, uh, this is how we're going to round out the Institute of Physics Writing Residency. And the body of work I created as part of all of it is over here, which some of you, I think, grabbed on the way in, which is very exciting. Um, and it's a pamphlet called Mapping the Depths of Us with editorial help from Will Keohan, designed by Gareth Jones, and based on interviews with Temelada Aragoke, Femi Bankole, Rucha Benare, who's also a poet and performing with us today, Dr. Sidney Joshi and Linda Hughes, uh, and it's free, so help yourself. So um, what I'm going to do now is read three poems from the pamphlet, and then I'll be introducing the other readers one by one as they do their readings. We're going to have a wee chat and then uh, a little bit of time at the end for audience questions. If you have any burning questions, keep them in mind throughout the event. Um, and yeah, I think that's all the intro I need to do. Also, if you want any more information about the residency, there's also recordings of previous events. At the back page of the pamphlet is the link where you can find everything. Okay, that is the long intro done. So I'm gonna read three poems from the pamphlet. The first one is Oracle, which is inspired by Linda Hughes. Some people might recognize her um, from Matt Aaron, and she does the weather sometimes, but she's an amazing meteorologist, and I got to interview her. And one of her interests was making sure that young girls know that you can be a meteorologist and have these interests and do whatever you want. So this is called Oracle. Girls aren't supposed to play with storms, but I am wound around them. 
their intricacies, soft breezes, and brutalities. Why wouldn't this be a space for a girl? Surely we belong in the eye of things, in the precision point of potential destruction. Haven't we always been seer, soothsayer, truth teller, Cassandra? Eyes always on things that shift, that flow, that rise and fall, the patterns of the world. Mouthpiece for foretelling, numbers and statistics flowing from fingertips, all lipstick and research. I hope they see me, messy pigtails, diamond-eyed, lightning-brained. I hope they point at the screen and ready themselves, curiosity ignited, prepare to step into a world of wind and blaze, salted equation, dark water and sky. And the second poem I have is inspired by Dr. Siddhi Joshi, who is uh, an oceanographer. And this poem is based on her talking to me about uh, remote operated vehicles that scan the seabed and gather information for researchers. And uh, I'm sure I should have been listening to the information, the scientific information, but I just kept thinking about the point of view of the robot on the seafloor. So uh, this is called Release. The deck is noise filled, babble, bustle and buttons, baited breath and strained muscles, sea spray and gray clouds fizz and glimmer. I crave release, can feel the cold reaching up from the surface, a universe of secrets waiting, impatient, heavy, swaying, I am ready to feel weightless. Finally, the lowering, the sigh of it, ice cold with the comfort of a hot bath, salt and flicker, rumble and pressure. The muffled silence of ocean, bubble and echo. No more small voices, shrill, sharp laughter. Only power, only the big, the wide, the open. I wonder if I could will it to happen. The cable, umbilical, designed to keep me unbirthed, tethered, tamed and trained. Imagine a snap, a wrench, a plummet, the weight of myself sinking, settling into sediment, into detritus, into seabed. Birthed into birthplace, from mother to mother, an inconceivable peace, unfathomable. I will not miss fluorescent lighting. I wasn't ready to return to the surface, to be dried out, analyzed, put to use again. I have no voice to scream in their faces, put me back. But I never really left, a part of me remains, while androids dream of electric sheep, ROVs dream of the sweet dark deep. And my last poem is inspired by Temelada Adegoke, who uh, works in the University of Limerick with something called the Transmission Electron Microscope, which is TEM, and her name is Temi, and she's very into the big microscope. It's literally the size of a room. So what she does is she sort of utilizes imaging techniques to examine um, responsive materials, particularly nanomaterials. Um, but also she was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and she has talked about the difficulties of working while affected by these symptoms, but pushing through it. Um, so essentially, I always knew this was going to be a love poem. So this is called The Girl is the Tower. The girl is the tower, is the little Lego man, is the girl staring at the screen, legs tired, boots chafing, until the images of nanowires are burnt into her eyeballs, stamped onto her corneas, her favorite film projected onto the back of her skull on repeat. At home in bed when she closes her eyes, the flaky tendrils and blurry grids pulse with promise and power, and when she has nightmares, they are of dendrites and exploding batteries and cars on fire, and the pain of dragging the carcass of hope back to square one. The smell of burning is still in her hair when she wakes, but when she dreams now, on the occasional night of solid sleep, soft smile, warm pillow, furrowed brow. She dreams of the perfect day when the sample prep is successful and her eyes light up, everything aligns just right. Let's not think of replicating this perfection, not right now. Let her enjoy the moment. When it's just her and the screen, the girl and the microscope the size of a room, 
They are in love, don't you see? You can't take her off the board. You can't treat her like the little Lego man, unclick her aching body, racked with pain, you know nothing of, wrung with fatigue, you know nothing of. They are Gemini souls, woman and microscope. Let them blaze quietly in the white room together. Thank you. Oh good, now I'm done. That's all over to you now. Okay, so uh, our first reader for today is Saoirse Anton, who is an Irish writer, producer, and performer. She's also a feminist, optimist, enthusiast, opinionated scamp, and human being. Congrats. Um, as a poet, she's uh, performed extensively in Ireland and the UK, and her poem has been published in Rise Up and Repeal, uh, writings from the city, Card of 75, and she was commissioned by No Fit State Circus to write a poem for the 2022 Clifton Street Festival, and in 2023 was poet and resident on their production, Sabotage. She's been commissioned by Studio 9 Animation Studio to, and RTE to write two short poetry films for children. Um, she's basically done a load of stuff, and they're all brilliant, ranging from poetry to circus to performance to theater and everything in between. Um, and when she's not writing, she performs with the Sparklets, Hula Hoop Troupe, and works as a freelance producer. But today you're here to do some physics poems. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, thank you, and welcome to the stage, Sersha Anton. Thank you very much, and sorry for giving you a, a mouthful of a bio. <laughs> um, so yes, today, when Shandrika got in touch with me, I kind of had a bit of imposter syndrome going, oh God, but I'm gonna be on a panel with a bunch of actual physicists. <laughs> and I just occasionally incorporate that into my poetry. But um, then I kind of realized that it's all ties into one. So I've got a poem for you about physics. I've got a poem for you about poetry. And then I've got a poem for you about life because at the end of the day, they kind of all come to the same thing. This one is Current Connections. The median nerve and the ulnar are mediators makers of meaning and motion. Behind Latin clinicality unseen, a current is sent from shoulder to pinky promise through a circuit in which the switch is the touch of another. Innumerable amperes of care surge from a hand on a shoulder. Fingertips and lips graze skin to spark a shock of desire and arms in embrace earth the current moment. No own's resistance delays this electricity as it carries a laugh through a hand on a knee. In the median nerve and in the ulnar, the current of life flows free. Thank you. And this next one is called I've Been Dreaming Lately. I've been dreaming lately of Charlie Chaplin's boots, of old cracked soles, of turned out toes, and of skint kids pinching food. I've been dreaming lately of things without space in the day, of sad things, of quiet things, and of those so far away. I've been dreaming lately of the soldier without a home, of lofty dreams, of horror scenes of the lied to and cast out alone. I've been dreaming lately of all the words left unsaid, of the could have beens, the should have beens, and the lives we've lived instead. I've been dreaming lately of parties at Downing Street, of sly contracts, of selfless acts of an NHS run off its feet. I've been dreaming lately of hope and things that might be, of optimism, of brave decisions of a future for you and for me. I've been dreaming lately of the words to that cranberry song, of children in war, of families apart and the egos that brought it all on. I've been dreaming lately and I'll dream until dreaming's done live a life that lives up to the dreaming of every soul under this sun. Thank you. And to round off, since I am a poet and not a physicist, this is a poem about poems, um, and uh, it's called The Best Poems, which I don't claim to write, but let's hope this is one of them. Because the best poems are written standing up. Root yourself to the ground and fill your cup with words until they spill onto the page. Let the rush of life rage through you and let that wave deliver you a verse. The best poems are written out loud. Loose your voice and speak to disperse the crowd of thoughts in which there is a hidden rhyme. Listen to the point in time you're in and in sounds and silent spaces. Begin. The best poems are written by a laugh. Share a glinting smile and find a first draft in that grin. 
The best poems are written in the dark. See the stars gleam bright and mark your constellation thoughts in biro ink. The best poems are written with a meal. In breaking bread with friends you find you feel those words you'll crystallize into type lines. The best poems are written while you walk. The best poems are written while you run. The best poems are written by the setting sun. In fleeting looks, in borrowed books between coffees and on a brisk winter breeze. When you pause, or you dance, or you take that chance, when you skip, or you trip, or you fall, the best poems that can ever be written. And they're not really written at all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sersha. Um, and our next reader is Iggy McGovern, who is Fellow Emeritus in Physics at Trinity College Dublin. He has published three collections of poetry with Daedalus Press, The King of Suburbia in 2005, Safe House 2010, and The Eyes of Isaac Newton in 2017. Other works include verse biographies of William Rowan Hamilton and Erwin Schrodinger, both with Quaternia Press. Prizes include the Hennessy Award for Poetry and the Glenn Dimplex New Writers Award for Poetry. And there was really no one else that I had to have on the panel other than Iggy because you've done so much work with physics and poetry and it's gonna be really exciting to hear you read some of your poems. So thank you so much. Uh, the first poem is, uh, uh, has the title of, well, the book, the last book is The Eyes of Isaac Newton, and this is the poem, The Eyes of Isaac Newton. The, um, he was a very strange man, Newton. He experimented on his, uh, his own eyes with a sharp blade. Uh, he also figured out that sight was the result of light coming into the eye rather than going out. And he reckoned that light was made of small particles, which was revolutionary. But as Einstein showed later, that's certainly true in some circumstances. He was master of the mint. He investigated fraudsters, known as coiners, and enjoyed hanging them. This is the eyes of Isaac Newton. Let us salute the oddest of them all who used a bodkin to investigate how pressure might affect his own eyeball, yet came down on the right of the debate that sight is intromittest, light received, and not that light from their captain's piercing eyes cause sol sol soldiers to shield theirs, as was believed by the ancient Greeks who would philosophize upon the origins of that salute and that this light was made up of corpuscles a fly ball that einstein would one day catch then played the private eye in hot pursuit of challoner their last of many tussles would see the coiner's bulging eyed dispatch second poem is uh, based on uh, uh, my favorite 18th century uh, portrait or painting. Uh, it's by Joseph Wright. And it depicts a family being entertained by the suffocation of a bird using the latest scientific tool, Robert Boyle's air pump. In the painting, the adults, adults are enthralled, the children are appalled, and there's a courting couple who might indulge in some similar activity. I use air pumps in my own research and I want to assure you no birds were harmed. An experiment on a bird in the air pump after the painting by Joseph Wright of Derby. An after dinner port and snuff diversion, this century of the scientificate is seriously right in front of the children. Even a daughter must remark the fate of the dove, is it? Perhaps a, a family pet? What rare conclusions might 
the magus straw, his fingers godlike on the air inlet, enunciating one more sacred law. The others play at minor parts. The job of cranking up the vacuum takes the breath from one son. The assistant with the fob watch later writes a poem about death. Let's not forget stage right, the courting pair, eyes only for each other. Left alone, they'd set some feathers flying through the air and make a fine snuff movie of their own. And finally, I've always loved proverbs and I've come to regard them as short poems in themselves. And in this sequence of single line poems, 10 old proverbs are modified as truisms that apply to the very modern arena of computer jargon. So maybe the, uh, well, I'll just go straight to them. This is called Proverbs for the Computer Age. An apple a day keeps the hacker away. Bod news fa travels fast. Better to light one intel than to cursor the darkness. When the mat's away, the mouse will play. Necessity is the motherboard of invention. Every blog has its day. Fight virus with virus. All that Twitters is not scrolled. Let sleeping laptops lie. And beware of geeks bearing gifs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Iggy. Next up, we have Rucha Benare, and this is exciting because I actually met her online when interviewing her about biomechanics, and that's, I wrote about, I think, four poems about your work in the pamphlet, and then found out that actually you were a poet yourself, so I figured I would drag you on stage and force you to be a poet in front of strangers. Um, so Rucha Benare is a biomedical engineering research student with a passion for rediscovering myths, biophysics, psychology, and poetry while living in different places and continents. Her heart currently oscillates between Ireland and India. Chai and spice bags are her constant companion as she works on projects such as an art book on biomechanics for charity and organ on chip technology. Welcome to the stage, Rucha. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Andrika. That's, that was a beautiful bio, by the way. That was a beautiful introduction. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> now, I, you inspired me. So I'm trying to unlock my phone. Sorry. I'm a very Gen Z person. I need my poems on my phone. Um, so I only started doing poetry almost only eight months ago. So please forgive me if I make any mistakes. My first poem is Biomechanics of a Beating Heart. All the lessons of helping heart patients in my medical device class could not prepare me for the eternity old question in my head. What to do with a heavy heart that bleeds blue and red? For the fading love of ghosts of my future and my pasts, long lost and gone far, far away. So I set out to conduct this experiment with all my anger and resentment for being too much of a woman despite being a child, for the world to never see me more than a centralized system, for my hypocrisy as I fought to become a sharp woman in STEM while I truly just dreamt of being soft, of tending tender things, of hiding of my future daughter, of a place where they can thrash and crash whenever of a place where no one would find us ever, of a place long lost and far, far away. And as I hunt in my abyss, I find glimpses of me in men, in women, in humans beyond, in my doomed childhood, 
coming out of the shadows of the Alps, of the Appalachians, of the Hajar, of the Himalayans. And sparks spasmed in my muscles as I got up from the floor for the tenth time for the billionth blow from the fifth land of monsters and men and angels caressing and women wounding. And as I oscillated between their pain and mine, forgiveness seemed so effing tricky, for F is equal to KX, my beloved Hooke's law, couldn't help me then, as the value of the force no longer remained linearly proportional to the sufferings, to the excruciating sufferings that exist in this world that seep into my thighs, into my eyes, into my tendons, into my bones. But we would never give up. I will never give up as long as I have my friends by my side and my love in the world. I can jump and face any storm with the spring in my step until the last beat in my heart. That's, that's that one, and I do biomedical engineering, so I had to say biomechanics in my title. The next one is a bit heavy. We're going right into it. It's, yeah, thank you. It's, it's called Black Hole of Grief. Like the refraction of light, his quiet smile splits my heart into a rainbow of emotions my heart couldn't analyze. It all feels warm and fuzzy like when you and your black cat rub your backs blissfully on the green grass, like when you welcome the sweet stains on the cellulose on your shirt, like when your belly finally relaxes as you let yourself asleep on a stranger's sofa in Ithaca, like when his hand holds yours and all nerves and tendons sigh with relief. But I did not feel so when I hunted in my darkness of my abyss to find the pure intentions of a liar and a thief. For now, now it just feels like when the wind took me and my uncle by the car with all its centrifugal force and swirled us twice on the way to Pittsburgh. I'm coming down from the war now, but I couldn't wrap my head around then, and my, I can't wrap my head around now. For why warriors who truly only want love wear their ugliest, unlovable selves as an armor? It's not bottled up, but it's all bottled now. On that lovely bleak note, that's me. Thank you for listening. And finally, last but very much not least, Rosamund Taylor is a winner of the Telegraph Poetry Prize 2023, the London Magazine Poetry Prize 2020, and the Martin Crawford Award for Poetry 2017. Her debut collection, In Her Jaws, by Banshee Press 2022, was shortlisted for the Seamus Heaney Poetry Prize for First Collection and the Yates Society Poetry Prize. Her work has been recorded for BBC Radio 4 and RT Radio. And I also just really love your physics poem, so that's why you're here today. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stage, Rosamond. everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, thank you so much for coming and thanks so much to Chandrika for gathering us all together. Um, all ecological poems are also science poems um, and I'd like to start with a, an eco poem. It's about a scientist called Eunice Newton Foote um, and she was the first person to observe that rising levels of CO2 would change the climate. And she wrote about this in a paper in 1856. Um, so this is a poem called Greenhouse Gases, 1856. Remembering how the waterfall made rainbows, I feel vapor on my lips, see ash leaves spinning green, sunlight fractured by our atmosphere. For my girls, I made a prism with a dish of water and a mirror. They were in bed getting over chickenpox and they stared at the square of color on the wall as though the white plaster was remade forever. I began to experiment between boiling preserves of plums and apples. In glass cylinders, I trapped the gases that make up our atmosphere. I checked my findings over and over. 
the world had been much hotter and would be again. Forests wrestle fire, crops become dust, children are winnowed away, raindrops into vapor. No one read it, no one read my paper, but I saw it all. We live at the very limit. And next I'd like to read a poem about Alicia Boulstott, who was the daughter of the mathematician George Boulle. Uh, she was born in 1860, and she had a remarkable ability to visualize the geometry of four dimensions, um, which is really difficult for most people because we live in three spatial dimensions. Uh, and she was able to create models of the four dimensions uh, using wood or cardboard, the way you or I might draw like a three-dimensional house or animal on a two-dimensional piece of paper. Uh, and those models were really helpful to other mathematicians of her day. And this poem is called Tesseract, because that's the name given to a four-dimensional cube. Tesseract. I made a tiny world on the hearth, coal scuttle a stable for ember horses. Ash people squeezed out of the dark grate, told me stories in crackling voices. I stroked frost burns on the windows, crystal castles made with silver arrow slits, full of markets selling cups of blue glacier. This was how I found the fourth dimension, another imagined stroll now in the tesseract. How I loved that word, tesseract, a new language of geometry. As candles turn my room into flickering flat images, the shadows of the table of my sleeping sister, so I curve shadows of four dimensions in wood. I find other worlds. It is my peculiar talent to never lose my footing across new angles. I carry my lantern across chasms. I'd like to finish up with a poem about how ideas of space travel and space, space exploration can bring us a lot of joy. Um, and this poem is about a subject very dear to my heart, uh, the TV show Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It's called In the History of Imagined Space Exploration. In the history of imagined space exploration, two women rarely share a cockpit, let alone a stolen one. Thanks to deliberately shaky cameras, this shuttle shudders like a cat that's put its paw in snow. Kira and Dax jolt together, almost in free fall, stars impossibly close and bright. Acting makes the ship fly too. Dax and Kira bicker as they jury-rig their weapons, rolling when they're hit, and smile even as sparks land in their hair. It's 1993 and 2370, and they know they're doing something special. The whole universe presses around my room as I watch. My lungs breathe, breathe moon dust, and were these walls to fall asunder, I'd not see a roof line but a haze of solar gases. I'll always need this, hearing Dax shout as phasers erupt. You fly, I'll shoot, holding my breath as the shuttle careens and the comrades brim with conviction that all the bad things in the universe can be fixed in a 40 minute episode. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for being so generous with sharing your poetry and your time with us. So now we have maybe about 10 minutes for a very brief chat before opening up to the audience uh, in case anyone has questions. Um, they might all be Star Trek themed, but that's still also okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I suppose you all come from such different backgrounds. Um, well, I made an assumption earlier that Rosamond and Sersha both are arts people 
looking at physics, but you just told me that actually your strongest subject was physics. And only in school, only in there's, school. Only to, there's a limit. <laughs> um, and we have Iggy, who's taught so many uh, physicists in Dublin, but has been writing collections about physics and poetry, and just poetry for a while. And then Rucha is someone who's an engineer and very recently started poetry. So you've all come at physics and poetry in very different ways. So I guess I'm gonna ask, what is it for each of you that draws you to poetry and draws you to science and that space in between? Start with you. Um, that's an enormous question. <laughs> um, but I think, I think, well, the same thing draws me to both. And I think it's ways of understanding. And I think that, um, I think poetry is for me a distillation of thoughts. And I, I always, um, when I write, I kind of gather things through the day, whether it's like pictures of things or literal objects or, or snippets of conversation. And then when I sit down to write, I kind of uh, delve into them and, and expand and distill and sort of form a poem out of them. And I think that I suppose science is another way of understanding the world around us. And I think that the two intersect a lot. Um, so yes, understanding, I think, is the, is the synopsis <laughs> and then a search for it. And Iggy, how about yourself? Because you've been in that space for, for at least three collections. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I think the only thing I can say is that uh, uh, how I ended up in that situation, and that was uh, that my wife uh, told me to go out and become interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I was a physics professor. I, I thought that was pretty good, <laughs> interesting. But uh, I, I, that's what I did. I just followed up that, that line. I mean, I could, I could sort of uh, make it longer by saying that you know, when I got to the, uh, the, the classes, the, uh, the car maintenance was really filled up. There was no room and, uh, and uh, all the other ones. And the only thing left was creative writing. So, so it was Accid just luck. Accident. Accident. <laughs> Accident. Just accident that um, brought you into poetry over mechanics. Yes. Well, it's a lucky accident anyways. Sure. Uh, and Rucha, for yourself, because this isn't the first time you've engaged with arts and science either. You created an art book about biomechanics, so poetry is your recent foray into it. So tell me about that relationship between science and art for you. Sure thing. Um, I mean, I have tried dropping out of engineering for the last two years, and I failed at it, and I, that's why I started doing poetry, to kind of just really navigate my place in STEM, my place as just a human being with clashing interests in just sciences especially, but at the same time, like the different cultures I'm navigating right now. Um, it, was, it was a bit of because of my aunt as well, she's a poet, and one of my best friends, he's a poet as well. So like watching them navigate their emotions, their upbringing, the way they handled their relationships with me, with other people, for the last few years really shaped my thinking about how poetry can be a really beautiful outlet. At the same time, because I was trying to drop out of engineering, I was like, what else can I do during my gap year, which I took last year? Um, as I really started engaging in poetry because of that. So it's only been eight months. But before that, like you said, um, I really, really know that it's not just one quantitative way of doing science, and we all know now there isn't. But um, it's very, I mean, I, I'm in love with science. It's very romantic. Science is my muse, and I think it was just that finding different ways to appreciate science and physics and the way I think. And I'm also very addicted to music, like, so it was just like bound to happen that this merge of thinking about science and feeling all this appreciation and gratitude for science as I grew up with it, it was very much an amal amalgamation of all those forces coming together, so yeah. Yeah. I love that, and I'm, I'm, we're just excited that you've reached that point, and it's very exciting. And Rosamond, you have these beautiful poems about a lot of different subjects, um, about queerness, about ecology, and then I just noticed these physics poems that were in your collection, and then it feels like you've been writing more poems about historical figures in science. So how did you come about to science and poetry? Um, I think as a poet, things that are very beautiful or very exciting 
are often things that inspire you to want to write something. And I think a lot of science, especially if you're not a scientist but are just an observer from the outside, seems both really exciting and really beautiful. Um, but also, I think the history of women in science is really compelling to me. Um, I've always been really interested in sort of women who have broken the mold and done something that is outside of the kind of preconceived gender norms. Um, and I think it's particularly striking when you read about women who had so much stacked against them and yet could still, still had so much passion for science and went ahead to make really important discoveries. And I think that's, I think most of my poems about science would be inspired by some particular woman who who sort of stepped outside what she was supposed to be doing. And I think that's something I resonate with as like for the pamphlet, that was basically it, was interviewing scientists, getting their stories, and it felt like there was never gonna be a lack of story, a lack of <laughs> something exciting to work with, and particularly with women and minoritized voices in STEM, there's, I guess, extra dimensions to their journey. Um, and that was something that, Rucha, when I wrote the poems about you, you brought that up a lot. So um, when we were talking uh, about your story, there's a lot of barriers that you were working against, um, but that also has pushed you in interesting new directions, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, just every institution I worked with so far, it's like all these different bubbles with their own like set of rules, this like different game plans they have, different agendas they have, and you, you can't help but feel like you're just a little subject or you're just a little um, pawn in the game and you're trying to make your own identity, like especially, I, I, was, I only started becoming you know, really me in the last two years, just 22, 23, and it's just, you feel like it's just these crazy different storms, you know, those storms that like shape a rock over years, that's like all of that, combined into a few months or years and it's like it's crazy how the way I'm rewired how much of that is because of people who don't even care about it in a way like obviously there are some well-wishers and mentors who have shaped me but most of it has been very much like understanding all these social cues in different cultures understanding the subtext and just kind of saying who are there for you who are not and how do you still work with them because deep down you all do want to deal with science or you want to work in science, like that is your big main thing or like you have a certain connection with science that you have to establish or rewire over and over again. And for me, I, like, I'm still learning to use all these um, setbacks or just like my, like stuff that is not really nice to you. I don't know how to like not be problematic <laughs> when I say that, like just different terms that systematically hold a woman or a man or any of any gender uh, identification, just kind of something that's always gonna set them back and it's really frustrating and it's, you really can't let it out on your friends either, but you need some sort of mechanism. And I think when you are faced with those pressures, I think the best thing you could do is really yeah, find creative outlets or just use that anger or passion or as a motivation. It's working so far <laughs> and uh, my friends have seen me grow in the last few years so I'm really grateful for them and yeah that's me. Yeah. Well it's exciting to find your way through that. Now Iggy, you, you're well versed with, the, uh, with academia and working within academia in physics but you have these events, these physics and poetry events and your launches so you have engaged with science communication through creativity. How have you sort of navigated these spaces of just the academic world, the research world, the competitive world, um, and, and then moving your own creative voice through that and engaging the public with science? Hmm. Well, maybe, maybe I go back to what I started, said at the start, which was that I ended up, how I ended up in poetry. Uh, and um, it was the, being sent out to become interesting. And I thought I noticed lots of people in the audience writing down their question that they were going to ask me, which was, did I become interesting? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, 
I, became, I did become interesting to myself. And I think that's, and that's something that's much along the lines of what you, you were saying as well. So, uh, and uh, to have that sort of second, uh, second uh, uh, level of activity is very, very important and very useful for each of those activities, you know. Uh, I think uh, very often you're very much governed by very strict rules in physics, and of course that's only, only right. But it sometimes stops us from being creative, sometimes. Yeah. So to have something that pushes you out uh, beyond yourself or beyond your, 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 your given sort of role, that, that's, that works all around. And I'm uh, very surprised at the number of scientists who actually did write poetry. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned, yeah, I think you did mention some, no, maybe you wrote about women in, in, in scientists who, who wrote, not about them writing poetry, but, but the, uh, I mean, you think of people like, uh, well, someone who's very much on the, on people's minds at the moment, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer wrote uh, poetry. It's fairly challenging poetry. Uh, uh, so uh, I, won't, I had some with me, but I won't go sh share them with you. <laughs> but uh, but um, that that idea of uh, of um, scientists writing poetry, well, it, it certainly caused some trouble with his friends. Uh, Dirac, who was uh, his friend, wrote to him and said, "You can't do physics and poetry at the same time. You just can't." He said, and he said, he said, uh, basically, uh, in physics, you get something that no one knew before, and you present it in words that everyone can understand. In poetry, you take something that everybody knows already and express it in words that no one can understand. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, but I mean, that's kind of... <laughs> but what's interesting enough was that uh, Dirac then wrote a poem afterwards, so. That's very interesting, even like the idea that these are different things, but mm. they overlap so much and often it's just it's just different ways of investigating life, yeah. Yeah. different languages and sometimes the same language. And Sersha, you have a lot of different creative languages <laughs> for your interests. Um, and I actually realized that you were interested in science because you were part of the Institute of Physics booklet. And I was surprised to find you in there because I know you're from the arts. So how did you end up in this space? Um, so the Institute of Physics booklet, I ended up involved in through another writer actually, um, Fiona Longmuir, who has, She's a, a novelist, but also write, works at the Institute of Physics, and um, so it was her that brought that to my attention. And uh, that was a really fun interview to do because it kind of, yeah, um, made me consider how my work intersects with, with physics and science more generally. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, to be honest, I can't exactly remember what the trajectory was, but as I said, there's kind of always been an overlap. I worked for a while at the Science Gallery, um, and I've just always had a broad interest in lots of things, and I think those things have always then informed my writing. Um, and yeah, being a bit of a massive nerd really helps with many things. <laughs> um, and so I think, yeah, that kind of led me when Fiona was talking about looking for artists to speak to. I, I, I chatted to her about it because, uh, yeah, it just made sense to me that, that the two would overlap. <laughs> Well, I think you're, you're in the right place with the art nerds and the science nerds. <laughs> Speaking of arts and science nerds, over to you all. Um, we have very little time, literally five minutes, um, for questions from the audience. Um, you might be able to grab us after if you have very burning questions that were unable to be answered. But um, if anyone has a question, now is your time. Well, forever hold your peace. <laughs> Is there anyone? Yes, we have one brave soul over there. I'm just going to wait for a microphone to get to you.
Yeah, um, for me at least, um, it's very opposite of what I do in engineering. It's very much like I'm in an emotional turmoil and at 2 a.m. I open my phone and I'm like, okay, I need to vomit what I'm feeling and it just starts going. But because I've been trained so well in like structure and analysis and it just, it's very scientific, the way the rhythm, the rhyme goes. So it's, it's the, the scientific part comes into play when I start typing. So before that, it's very much like, oh, there's this thing that really happened with me. And um, it's similar to my brother, he's also an artist, so it's very much that we really need to be in the zone. Like sometimes even for science as well, like sometimes you need to be in the zone to do the science. So for me, at least, uh, it's, it's, the structure comes later. It's very much like looking at it afterwards and being like, okay, if I say it out loud, I is there some sort of, it's almost like there are a few variables and there's like an equation in my brain, oh, it's matching that rhythm in my brain when I say it out loud. So the, the structure comes later. Yeah. I think it's really lucky to have that urge that really makes you want to write something. And I think as I have written more and more, I've become less and less inspired to the point where I'm not sure I've had an idea since about 2012. <laughs> um, so I find the structure really, really helpful. Um, the idea of challenging yourself to write a sonnet or to have some kind of formal structure on what you're doing can help certainly to sort of arrange your ideas. And I think as well, I find it really helpful to look to scientists and to see the discipline and arrangement of their thoughts and to think, well, maybe I can arrange a poem in a way that is also sensible and organized. Um, and I find, that, I find that really useful. Yeah. I think there's something there in that about the structure. So I, I think for, for the poems that tend to make it out into the world, I tend to start writing them because I have something I need to say. And, and whether that comes out as a poem or whatever remains to be seen as the idea first germinates. But, um, but a lot of the time in, in making a practice of writing, I will write, you know, I might sit down in the morning and go, yes, I'm going to write a sonnet or I'm going to write whatever particular form and will make something in that form and, and having those structural, that structural discipline then means that when the ideas that demand to be written turn up, you then have a framework to work within and you have this, um, I suppose a toolbox um, that you can dip into and find the best shape to express that thought in. Yeah. yeah. We have time, oh sorry. Oh, yeah. I was. No, go for it. No, Maybe. just to say, I mean, I'm just going to take all of those and color them together. They, they're right. All of them are right. <laughs> uh, I'm a structuralist, no, no doubt about it. And uh, uh, sonnets is what I, I do. And uh, in fact, my nickname in the, the household was uh, Sonnet, Sonnet the Egg Hedgehog. <laughs> uh, so uh, and now I'm working on the ultimate sonnet, which is known as a crown of sonnets, mm. which where you, the sonnet itself is 14 lines. The crown of sonnets is 14 sonnets that are linked together. So don't be in any hurry to do that. Start, <laughs> start, start with the sonnet itself. Um, I can take one very speedy question because they're literally going to boot us out of the room in about five minutes. So person in front, that's you. Yes, hello. Do I wait for a mic or do I just ask? You can ask and I can say it through the microphone if people yeah. can't hear. <laughs> is poetry and science the same gorgeous? Is how I'm going to summarize that. Uh, that's, that's a great question. Is that our time up? Yes. Go for it. You can answer. <laughs> oh, is that it? <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I think they all have beauty in them. They do. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and to, well, I think it's a pity in a way that the beauty in physics often gets kind of... Uh, does it, not, it doesn't upset people, but they never get a chance to see it as beauty because of a certain element to physics called mathematics, <laughs> which itself has its own beauty, but often uh, mathematics is, a, is, a, is something that stops people from seeing the beauty in, in physics, but that's not really an answer. That's, that's another day. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much for your questions. I think that was a wonderful uh, sentiment to end on, that poetry and physics are both very gorgeous. And thank you to our gorgeous panelists. Thank you to the Institute of Physics and to the Arts Council for funding this entire project. And it's been wonderful to be the writer in residence for the Institute of Physics this year. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dublin Book Festival. And you are now released from this room. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.